This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Environment No philosophy or movement for liberation can ignore the connection between human exploitation of the environment and our exploitation of one another, nor can it ignore the suicidal ramifications of industrial society. A free society must forge a respectful and sustainable relationship with its bioregion on the understanding that humans depend on the health of the entire planet. What's to stop someone from destroying the environment? Some people oppose capitalism on environmental grounds, but think some sort of state is necessary to prevent ecocide. But the state itself is a tool for the exploitation of nature. Socialist states, such as the Soviet Union and People's Republic of China, have been among the most ecocidal regimes imaginable. That these two societies never escape the dynamics of capitalism is itself a feature of the state structure. It necessitates hierarchical, exploitative economic relationships of control and command. And once you start playing that game, nothing beats capitalism. However, the state does present the possibility of forcibly changing people's behavior on a massive scale. And this power is attractive to some environmentalists. There have been a few states in world history that enforced protective measures domestically, when saving the environment coincided with their strategic interests. One of the foremost is Japan, which halted and reversed deforestation in the archipelago around the Meiji period. But in this case and other cases, domestic environmental protections enforced by the state were coupled with greater exploitation abroad. Japanese society consumed increasing amounts of imported wood, fueling deforestation in other countries and providing an incentive for the development of an imperial military to secure these vital resources. This led not only to environmental devastation, but also to warfare and genocide. Similarly, in Western Europe, Statist environmental protections came at the expense of colonial exploitation, which also resulted in genocide. In smaller-scale societies, the existence of an elite tends to fuel environmental exploitation. The renowned social collapse on Easter Island was caused in large part by the elite, who compelled the society to build statues in their honor. This statue-building complex deforested the island, as large numbers of logs were needed for scaffolding and transportation of the statues, and farmland to feed the laborers came at the expense of more forests. Without forests, soil fertility plummeted, and without food, the human population plunged as well. But they didn't just starve or decrease their birth rate. The clan elites warred with one another, knocking down rival statues and carrying out raids that culminated in cannibalism until nearly the entire society died off. A decentralized, communal society with a commonly held ecological ethos is the best equipped to prevent environmental destruction. In economies that value local self-sufficiency over trade and production, communities have to deal with the environmental consequences of their own economic behaviors. They cannot pay others to take their garbage or starve, so they can have an abundance. Local control of resources also discourages overpopulation. Studies have shown that when the members of a society can directly see how having too many children will diminish the resources available for everyone, they keep their families within a sustainable limit. But when these localized societies are incorporated into a globalized economy in which most resources and wastes are imported and exported, and scarcity results from seemingly arbitrary price fluctuations rather than the depletion of local resources, populations climb unsustainably even if more effective forms of contraception are also available. In Seeing Like a State, James Scott explains how governments enforce legibility, a uniformity that enables comprehension from above in order to control and track subjects. As a result, such societies lose the local knowledge necessary to understand problems and situations. Capitalism, Christianity, and Western science all share a certain mythology regarding nature which encourages exploitation and contempt, and views the natural world as dead, mechanical, 
and existing to satisfy human consumption. This megalomania masquerading as reason or divine truth has revealed itself beyond all doubt to be suicidal. What is needed instead is a culture that respects the natural world as a living, interconnected thing and understands our place within it. Bruce Stewart, a Maori writer and activist, told an interviewer pointing to a flowering vine he had planted by his house, quote, This vine no longer has a name. Our Maori name has been lost, so we'll have to find another. Only one of this plant remained in the world, living on a goat-infested island. The plant could go any day, so I got a seed and planted it here. The vine has grown, and although it normally takes twenty years to bloom, this one is blooming after seven. If we are to survive, each of us must become kaitiaki, which to me is the most important concept in my own Maori culture. We must become caretakers, guardians, trustees, nurturers. In the old days, each wano, or family, used to look after a specific piece of terrain. One family might look after a river from a certain rock down to the next bend, and they were the kaitiaki of the birds and fish and plants. They knew when it was time to take them to eat and when it was not. When the birds needed to be protected, the people put a rahui on them, which means the birds were temporarily sacred. And some birds were permanently tapu, which means they were full-time protected. This protection was so strong that people would die if they broke it. It's that simple. It needed no policing. In their eagerness to unsavage my ancestors, Christian missionaries killed the concept of tapu along with many others. Unquote. Tokopia, a Pacific island settled by Polynesian people, provides a good example of a decentralized anarchic society that has successfully dealt with life and death environmental problems. The island is only 1.8 square miles in area and supports 1,200 inhabitants, that is, 800 people per square mile of farmland. The community has existed sustainably for 3,000 years. Tokopia is covered in multi-storied orchard gardens that mimic the natural rainforests. At first sight, most of the island appears to be covered in forest, though true rainforests only remain on a few steep parts of the island. Tokopia is small enough that all its inhabitants can become familiar with their entire ecosystem. It is also isolated, so for a long time they could not import resources or export the consequences of their lifestyle. Each of the four clans have chiefs, though these have no coercive powers and play a ceremonial role as the custodians of tradition. Tokopia is among the least socially stratified of the Polynesian islands. For example, the chiefs still have to work and produce their own food. Population control is a common value, and parents feel it is immoral to have more than a certain number of children. In one striking example of the power of these collectively held and reinforced values, around the year 1600, the islanders reached a collective decision to end pig breeding. They slaughtered all the pigs on the island, even though pig meat was a highly valued food source, because keeping pigs was a major strain on the environment. In a more stratified, hierarchical society, this might have been impossible because the elite would typically force the poorer people to suffer the consequences of their lifestyles rather than give up on an esteemed luxury product. Before colonization and the disastrous arrival of missionaries, population control methods on Tokopia included natural contraception, abortion, and abstinence for younger people, though this was a compassionate celibacy that amounted to a prohibition on reproduction rather than on sex. Tokopians also used other forms of population control, such as infanticide, that many people in other societies would find impermissible. But Tokopia can still provide us with a perfectly valid example, because with the effectiveness of modern contraception and abortion techniques, no other methods are necessary for a decentralized approach to population control. The most important feature of the Tokopian example is their ethos. Their recognition that they lived on an island and resources were limited, so that increasing their population was tantamount to suicide. Other Polynesian island societies ignored that fact and subsequently died off. The planet Earth, in this sense, is also an island, 
accordingly. We need to develop both global consciousness and localized economies so we can avoid exceeding the capacity of the land and stay aware of the other living things with whom we share this island. Today, most of the world is not organized into communities that are structured to be sensitive to the limits of the local environment. But it is possible to recreate such communities. There is a growing movement of ecologically sustainable communities, or so-called eco-villages, organized on horizontal, non-hierarchical lines, in which groups of people ranging from a dozen to several hundred come together to create anarchic societies with organic, sustainable designs. The construction of these villages maximizes resource efficiency and ecological sustainability, and also cultivates sensitivity to the local environment on a cultural and spiritual level. These eco-villages are at the forefront of developing sustainable technologies. Any alternative community can degenerate into yuppie escapism, and eco-villages are vulnerable to this. But a leading part of the eco-village movement seeks to develop and spread innovations that are relevant to the world at large, rather than to close itself off from the world. To help proliferate eco-villages and adapt them to all regions of the globe, and to facilitate coordination between existing eco-villages, 400 delegates from 40 countries met in Findhorn, Scotland in 1995 and established the Global Eco-Village Network. Each eco-village is a little different, but a few examples can provide an idea of their diversity. The farm in rural Tennessee has 350 residents. Established in 1971, it contains mulch gardens, solar-heated showers, a sustainable shiitake mushroom business, straw bale houses, and a center for training people from around the world to build their own eco-villages. Old Basaisa in Egypt contains a few hundred residents and has existed for thousands of years. The residents have perfected an ecological and sustainable village design from traditional methods. Old Basaisa now contains a future studies center, and they are developing new sustainable technologies like a methane gas producing unit that extracts gases from cow manure to save themselves from having to use scarce firewood. They use their leftover slurry as fertilizer for their fields. Ecotop, near Dusseldorf in Germany, is an entire suburb with hundreds of residents living in several four-story apartment buildings and a few detached homes. The architecture fosters a sense of community and freedom with a number of communal and private spaces. Between the buildings in a sort of village center is a multi-use courtyard slash playground slash pedestrian zone, as well as community gardens and an abundance of plants and trees. The buildings, which have a completely modern urban aesthetic, were constructed with natural materials and designed with passive heating and cooling and biological on-site wastewater management. Birthhaven, with about 60 residents, was founded in 1995 in North Carolina by permaculture designers. It is composed of several neighborhood clusters set in the steep Appalachian Hills. Most of the land is covered in forest, but the residents recently made the difficult decision to clear some of the forest for gardens so they could come closer to food self-sufficiency rather than exporting the cost of their lifestyle by purchasing food from elsewhere. They talked about it a long time, prepared themselves spiritually, and attempted to clear the land in a respectful way. This sort of attitude, which capitalist ideology would dismiss as sentimental and inefficient, is exactly what could prevent destruction of the environment in an anarchist society. Also necessary are fierceness and the willingness to take direct action to defend the environment. On the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in Oaxaca, Mexico, anarchist and anti-authoritarian indigenous people have shown exactly these qualities in protecting the land against a series of threats. Organizations such as the Union of Indigenous Communities of the Northern Zone of the Isthmus Gizoni, which includes 100 communities in Oaxaca and Veracruz, and later the anarchist Macanista group Sipo RFM, have fought against the environmentally devastating construction of wind farms, shrimp farms, eucalyptus plantations, and the expropriation of land by the lumber industry. They have also reduced economic pressures to exploit the environment by setting up corn and coffee cooperatives and building schools and clinics. 
Meanwhile, they have created a network of autonomous community radio stations to educate people about the dangers to the environment and inform the surrounding communities about new industrial projects that would destroy more land. In 2001, the indigenous communities defeated the construction of a highway that was part of Plan Puebla Panama, a neoliberal megaproject intended to connect North and South America with transportation infrastructure designed to increase the flow of commodities. During the Zapatista Rebellion of 1994, they shut down transportation lines to slow down the movement of troops, and they also blocked highways and shut down government offices to support the 2006 rebellion throughout Oaxaca. In 1998, the Minnesota Department of Transportation wanted to reroute a highway through a park in Minneapolis along the confluence of the Minnesota and the Mississippi Rivers. The proposed reroute would destroy an area that contained old trees, a precious oak savanna ecosystem, an ancient freshwater spring, and sites sacred to Native Americans, a vital, wild space in the middle of the city that also served as a refuge for many neighbors. Indigenous activists with the American Indian Movement and the Mendota Dakota community came together to work in a coalition with white residents, environmentalists from Earth First, and anarchists from all over the country to help stop the construction. The result was the Minnehaha Free State, an autonomous zone that became the first and longest-lasting urban anti-road occupation in U.S. history. For a year and a half, hundreds of people occupied the land to prevent the Department of Transportation from cutting down the trees and building the highway, and thousands more supported and visited the Free State. The occupation empowered countless participants, reconnected many Dakota people with their heritage, won the support of many neighbors, created a year-long autonomous zone and self-organizing community, and significantly delayed the destruction of the area, buying time during which many people were able to discover and enjoy the space in an intimate and spiritual way. To crush the occupation, the state was forced to resort to a variety of repressive tactics. The people at the encampment were subjected to harassment, surveillance, and infiltration. An army of police officers raided and destroyed the camps repeatedly, tortured, hospitalized, and almost killed people, and carried out over a hundred arrests. In the end, the state cut down the trees and built the highway. But the protesters did manage to save Coldwater Spring, which is a sacred site to the area's indigenous peoples, and an important part of the local watershed. The Native participants declared an important spiritual victory. People throughout Minneapolis, who had initially supported the destructive project because of its supposed benefits to the transportation system, were won over by the resistance to save the park and came to oppose the highway. If the decision had been up to them, the highway would not have been built. The Free State created and nurtured coalitions and community bonds that last to this day, shaping new generations of radical community and inspiring similar efforts around the world. Outside Edinburgh, Scotland, eco-anarchists have had even more successes saving a forest. The Bilston Glen Anti-Roads Camp has existed for over seven years as of this writing, drawing the participation of hundreds of people and stopping the construction of a bypass desired by large biotech facilities in the area. To allow people to live there permanently with a lower impact on the forest, and to make it harder for police to evict them, the activists have built houses up in the trees, which people occupy year-round. The village is certainly low technology, but it is also low impact, and some of the houses are clearly works of love, comfortable enough to be considered permanent homes. The dozen or so inhabitants have also been tending the forest, removing invasive species and encouraging the growth of native species. The Bilston Glen Tree Village is just one in a long line of anti-road occupations and ecological direct actions in the UK that create a collective force that makes the state think twice about building new roads or evicting protesters. The village also crosses the line between simply opposing government policy and creating new social relations with the environment. In the course of defending it, dozens of people have made the forest their home. And hundreds more people have personally seen the importance of relating with nature 
in a respectful way in defending it from Western civilization. What about global environmental problems like climate change? Anarchists do not yet have experience dealing with global problems because our successes so far have only been local and temporary. Stateless anarchic societies once covered the world, but this was long before the existence of global environmental problems like those created by capitalism. Today, members of many of these indigenous societies are at the forefront of global resistance to the ecological destruction caused by governments and corporations. Anarchists also coordinate resistance globally. They organize international protests against major polluters and their state backers, such as the mobilizations during the G8 summits that have convened hundreds of thousands of people from dozens of countries to demonstrate against the states most responsible for global warming and other problems. In response to the global activity of transnational corporations, ecologically minded anarchists share information globally. In this manner, activists around the world can coordinate simultaneous actions against corporations, targeting a polluting factory or mine on one continent, retail stores on another continent, and an international headquarters or shareholders meeting on another continent. For example, Major protests, boycotts, and acts of sabotage against Shell Oil were coordinated among people in Nigeria, Europe, and North America throughout the 1980s and 90s. In 1986, Autonomous in Denmark carried out multiple simultaneous firebombings of Shell stations across the country during a worldwide boycott to punish Shell for supporting the government responsible for apartheid in South Africa. In the Netherlands, the clandestine anti authoritarian group RARA, Revolutionary Anti Racist Action carried out a campaign of non lethal bombings against Shell Oil, playing a crucial role in forcing Shell to pull out of South Africa. In 1995, when Shell wanted to dump an old oil rig in the North Sea, it was forced to abandon its plans by protests in Denmark and the UK, an occupation of the oil rig by Greenpeace activists, and a firebombing and a shooting attack against Shell stations in two different cities in Germany, as well as a boycott that lowered sales by 10% in that country. Efforts such as these prefigure the decentralized global networks that could protect the environment in an anarchist future. If we succeed in abolishing capitalism and the state, we will have removed the greatest systemic ravagers of the environment, as well as the structural barriers that currently impede popular action in defense of nature. There are historical examples of stateless societies responding to large-scale, collective environmental problems through decentralized networks. Though the problems were not global, the relative distances they faced, with information traveling at a pedestrian's pace, were perhaps greater than the distances that mark today's world, in which people can communicate instantaneously, even if they live on opposite sides of the planet. Tonga is a Pacific archipelago settled by Polynesian peoples. Before colonization, it had a centralized political system with a hereditary leader. But the system was far less centralized than a state, and the leader's coercive powers were limited. For 3,200 years, the people of Tonga were able to maintain sustainable practices over an archipelago of 288 square miles, with tens of thousands of inhabitants. There was no communications technology, so information traveled slowly. Tonga is too large for a single farmer to have knowledge of all the islands, or even all of any of its large islands. The leader was traditionally able to guide and ensure sustainable practices, not through recourse to force, but because he had access to information from the entire territory. Just as a federation or general assembly would if the islanders organized themselves in that way. It was up to the individuals who made up the society to implement particular practices and support the idea of sustainability. The fact that a large population can protect the environment in a diffuse or decentralized manner without leadership is amply demonstrated by the aforementioned New Guinea Highlanders. Agriculture usually leads to deforestation as land is cleared for fields, and deforestation can kill the soil. Many societies respond by clearing more land to compensate for lower soil productivity, thus aggravating the problem. Numerous civilizations have collapsed because they destroy their soil through deforestation. The danger of soil erosion is accentuated in mountainous terrain, such as the New Guinea highlands, 
where heavy rains can wash away denuded soil en masse. A more intelligent practice, which the farmers in New Guinea perfected, is silviculture, integrating trees with other crops, combining orchard, field, and forest to protect the soil and create symbiotic chemical cycles between the various cultivated plants. The people of the highlands developed special anti-erosion techniques to keep from losing the soil of their steep mountain valleys. Any particular farmer might have gained a quick advantage by taking shortcuts that would eventually cause erosion and rob future generations of healthy soil. Yet sustainable techniques were used universally at the time of colonization. Anti-erosion techniques were spread and reinforced using exclusively collective and decentralized means. The Highlanders did not need experts to come up with these environmental and gardening technologies, and they did not need bureaucrats to ensure that everyone was using them. Instead, they relied on a culture that valued experimentation, individual freedom, social responsibility, collective stewardship of the land, and free communication. Effective innovations developed in one area spread quickly and freely from valley to valley. Lacking telephones, radio, or internet, and separated by steep mountains, each valley community was like a country unto itself. Hundreds of languages are spoken within the New Guinea Highlands, changing from one community to the next. Within this miniature world, no one community could make sure that other communities were not destroying their environment. Yet their decentralized approach to protecting the environment worked. Over thousands of years, they protected their soil and supported a population of millions of people living at such a high population density that the first Europeans to fly overhead saw a country they likened to the Netherlands. Water management in that lowland northern country in the 12th and 13th centuries provides another example of bottom-up solutions to environmental problems. Since much of the Netherlands is below sea level, and nearly all of it is in danger of flooding, farmers had to work constantly to maintain and improve the water management system. The protections against flooding were a common infrastructure that benefited everybody, yet they also required everyone to invest in the good of the collective to maintain them. An individual farmer stood to gain by shirking water management duties, but the entire society would lose if there were a flood. This example is especially significant because Dutch society lacked the anarchistic values common in indigenous societies. The area had long been converted to Christianity and indoctrinated in its ecocidal, hierarchical values. For hundreds of years, it had been under the control of a state, though the empire had fallen apart, and in the 12th and 13th centuries, the Netherlands were effectively stateless. Central authority in the form of church officials, feudal lords, and guilds remained strong in Holland and Zeeland, where capitalism would eventually originate. But in northern regions, such as Friesland, society was largely decentralized and horizontal. At that time, contact between towns dozens of miles apart, several days' travel, could be more challenging than global communication in the present day. Despite this difficulty, farming communities, towns, and villages managed to build and maintain extensive infrastructure to reclaim land from the sea and protect against flooding amid fluctuating sea levels. Neighborhood councils, by organizing cooperative work bands or dividing duties between communities, built and maintained the dikes, canals, sluices, and drainage systems necessary to protect the entire society. It was, quote, a joint approach from the bottom up from the local communities that found their protection through organizing themselves in such a way, unquote. Spontaneous horizontal organizing even played a major role in the feudal areas such as Holland and Zealand, and it is doubtful that the weak authorities who did exist in those parts could have managed the necessary waterworks by themselves, given their limited power. Though the authorities always take credit for the creativity of the masses, Spontaneous self-organization persists even in the shadow of the state. The only way to save the planet. When it comes to protecting the environment, nearly any social system would be better than the one we have now. Capitalism is the first social arrangement in human history to endanger the survival of our species and life on Earth in general. Capitalism provides incentives to exploit and destroy nature and creates an atomized society that is incapable of protecting the environment. Under capitalism, ecocide is literally a right. 
Environmental protections are so-called trade barriers. Preventing a corporation from clear-cutting land it has purchased is a violation of private property and free enterprise. Companies are allowed to make millions of tons of plastic, most of it for throwaway packaging, despite the fact that they have no plan for disposing of it, and not even any idea what will happen with it all. Plastic does not decompose, so plastic trash is filling up the ocean and appearing in the bodies of marine creatures, and it may last millions of years. To save endangered rhinoceros from poachers, game wardens have started sawing off their valuable horns. But the poachers are killing them anyway, because once they are extinct, the value of the few remaining bits of rhinoceros ivory will go through the roof. And despite all this, universities have the audacity to indoctrinate students to believe that a communal society would be incapable of protecting the environment because of the so called tragedy of the commons. This myth is often explained thus. Imagine a society of sheep herders owns the grazing land in common. They benefit collectively if each grazes a smaller number of sheep because the pasture stays fertile, but any one of them benefits individually if he overgrazes because he will receive a greater share of the product. Thus, collective ownership supposedly leads to depletion of resources. The historical examples intended to corroborate this theory are generally drawn from colonial and post colonial situations in which oppressed people, whose traditional forms of organization and stewardship had been undermined, are crowded onto marginal land with predictable results. The sheep herding scenario assumes a situation that is extremely rare in human history, a collective comprised of atomized, competitive individuals who value personal wealth over social bonds and ecological health, and lack social arrangements or traditions that can guarantee sustainable, shared use. Capitalism has already caused the biggest wave of extinctions to hit the planet since an asteroid collision killed off the dinosaurs. To prevent global climate change from bringing about total ecological collapse and stop pollution and overpopulation from killing off most of the planet's mammals, birds, amphibians, and marine life, we have to abolish capitalism, hopefully within the next few decades. Human-caused extinctions have been apparent for at least a hundred years now. The greenhouse effect has been widely acknowledged for nearly two decades. The best that the reputed ingenuity of free enterprise has come up with is carbon trading, a ridiculous farce. Likewise, we cannot trust some world government to save the planet. A government's first concern is always its own power, and it builds the base of this power upon economic relationships. The governing elite must maintain a privileged position, and that privilege depends on the exploitation of other people and of the environment. Localized, egalitarian societies linked by global communication and awareness are the best chance for saving the environment. Self-sufficient, self-contained economies leave almost no carbon footprint. They don't need petroleum to ship goods in and waste out, or huge amounts of electricity to power industrial complexes to produce goods for export. They must produce most of their energy themselves via solar, wind, biofuel, and similar technologies and rely more on what can be done manually than on electrical appliances. Such societies pollute less because they have fewer incentives to mass production, and lack the means to dump their byproducts on others' land. In place of busy airports, traffic-clogged highways, and long commutes to work, we can imagine bicycles, buses, interregional trains, and sailboats. Likewise, populations will not spiral out of control, because women will be empowered to manage their fertility and the localized economy will make apparent the limited availability of resources. An ecologically sustainable world would have to be anti-authoritarian, so no society could encroach on its neighbors to expand its resource base. And cooperative, so societies could band together in self-defense against a group developing imperialist tendencies. Most importantly, it would demand a common ecological ethos, so people would respect the environment rather than regarding it simply as raw material to exploit. We can begin building such a world now, by learning from ecologically sustainable indigenous societies, sabotaging and shaming polluters, spreading a love for nature and an awareness of our bioregions, and establishing projects that allow us to meet our needs for food, water, and energy locally. Recommended Reading Nirmal Sangupta, 
Managing Common Property, Irrigation in India and the Philippines, New Delhi, Sage, 1991. Winona LaDuke, Recovering the Sacred, The Power of Naming and Claiming, Cambridge, South End Press, 2005. Jan Martin Bang, Eco Villages, A Practical Guide to Sustainable Communities, Edinburgh, Flores Books, 2005. Heather C. Flores, Food Not Lawns, How to Turn Your Yard into a Garden and Your Neighborhood into a Community, White River Junction, Vermont, Chelsea Green, 2006. Jared Diamond, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, New York, Viking, 2005. Murray Bookchin, The Ecology of Freedom, The Emergence and Dissolution of Hierarchy, Palo Alto, California, Cheshire Books, 1982. Ellie King, editor. Listen, the story of the people at Takuwakan Tipi and the reroute of Highway 55, or the Minnehaha Free State. Tucson, Arizona, Feral Press, 2006. Bill Holmgren and David Mollison. Permaculture One, a perennial agriculture for human settlements. Sydney, Corgi Books, 1978. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.